and 1969, of course, was the first landing on the moon. But perhaps even more important for mankind was an event that occurred four years earlier, and that was the placement in geostationary orbit of our very first communication satellite. And it is an item that has elegant simplicity. We put photovoltaic arrays in the high Earth orbit that supply electrical power converted from sunlight. These satellites then send that power to Earth receivers. Signals impressed on their power transmit our television, telephone, and other signals. This technology, as we all know, has transformed the very lives of all mankind. As these satellites appear to be stationary when viewed from Earth, their beams are always available, and we enjoy these services around the clock without even thinking of the technology or even associate them with space. Like the air we breathe, they are just there. No one under the age of 45 has ever been without them. We now know how to approach the engineering task to redesign and scale up this concept to obtain our electrical power from space. That power will be baseload or dispatchable power as opposed to the intermittent power produced here on Earth, whether it's wind or tide or solar. Now, an important point to be made about the satellite solar power is that there is no new science required. The scale-up is enormous, but it has precedence, one example being the memory chips of our computers. In the 1970s, Boeing and North American each did extensive studies under contract for NASA and the Department of Energy. By 1980, these studies had confirmed technical feasibility. The person assigned by the Department of Energy, Fred Kumanoff, was initially a skeptic. And at the end of the studies, he was a total enthusiast, which did not serve him well in his department, which is fundamentally an atomic energy department. I managed the space transportation part of the Boeing study and became good friends with people like Gordon Woodcock and Ralph Nansen, and they're still some of my closest friends. As a part of this work, we did extensive environmental impact statements that showed very favorable results compared to the environmental impact, such as land use and the use of water, of other energy options. And the safety of power from space was assured by the analysis that we had done. Confirming these anal analyses by tests remains ahead of us. Unfortunately, by the time the studies were completed in 1980, the Arab oil embargo had ended and energy complacency had returned to the world and is still present. Later, a 2001 review by the National Academy of Engineering reviewed the work done by John Mankins at NASA in a revisit to the topic. And once again, the technical feasibility of power from space was confirmed. I was asked by the Academy of Engineering to be a part of this work and did so. In more recent times, the Department of Defense, through their National Security Space Office, performed a volunteer study by people within their organization and a group of some 300 volunteers, including myself. Uh, this also confirmed the feasibility of, and more importantly, the contributions to our national security of deriving our power from space. This power will be pollution-free, and unlike all terrestrial systems, its waste heat will largely be radiated into deep space rather than deposited in our lakes, streams, and our atmosphere. It also benefits from the solar intensity in space being some 37% higher than it is here on Earth. And the comparison that's drawn by an outfit called PowerSight.com says that uh, for every square meter of solar array uh, with the atmospheric losses, you have to have 1.37 square meters here on Earth. But when you consider the day-night cycle, on the average, it's 3.65 meters with weather 
with only five overcast days a month, it's up to 18.3. And if you have to feed energy storage to provide 24-hour-a-day power, which is inherent with space power, you're now at a multiple of 43. That is, a given area of solar arrays in space will give you 43 times as much as that same array placed here on Earth, provided you have energy storage. So I think it's a very important factor that uh, should help overcome the problems we have in providing the space transportation to the high orbit. Now, placement of the arrays in solar orbit can therefore greatly multiply the uh, amount of energy we get per unit of photovoltaic cell produced. And there's a directed receivers near our cities, as we've learned here in Texas, the long transmission lines going through people's ranches and farms is most unpopular and experience high costs and losses. And since we can place these receivers near the load centers of our cities, these losses and costs are minimized. I believe the time is now to take another serious look at space-based solar power, this time as a commercial enterprise. For the past year, I've been in contact with a financier in Connecticut who calls himself a financial engineer, and he has a background of arranging equity capital for major activities that measures in the billions of dollars. And this man tells me that space-based solar power can now be implemented entirely in the private sector, freeing us from our energy and pollution concerns. These can be done with no additional cost to taxpayers for NASA, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, who would just continue whatever priorities they deemed important to develop the technology to meet their needs and use that technology for ours as well. The private capital markets would finance the space-based solar program without any direct cash contributions from these governmental organizations, says this financial engineer. I've been working very hard to poke holes in his argument and to feed him the facts so that he isn't going to be telling lies to the people he deals with. But he claims to have a very large financial uh, allocation ready to be made. As we now know the physics and technology that will permit us building a demonstration project or a prototype system. And step one, in my view, is, in an, is a large system study to revisit the land that we visited in 1967 to 1970 to confirm that the facts bear out the statements that have been made supporting it. So I believe it's entirely possible with this extension of the wonderful communication satellite capability we now all take for granted can soon yield additional large benefits of space for all mankind, resolving for all time our increasing need for, for energy. And to borrow a phrase from an earlier period of my life, this is a piece of enterprise. We came in peace for all mankind. But uh, there's a great deal of resistance to this from two particular communities. One is the oil and gas industry, who have made the decision years ago they're going to ride this horse till it falls. And they're adamantly opposed to any competitive source of energy. The other uh, is the nuclear community, who have been working on fusion energy for the past 30 years, and it's remained 20 years in advance before it's useful for 30 years and is very apt to remain that way for another 30. But the high energy physics community don't look kindly upon competition, and they too have lobbied against it. And Congress, as we all know, is receptive to congressional uh, campaign contributions and lobbyists. And I think that's a very large part of the resistance to it. The other resistance is that the findings that we had in 1980 were that the power that would be supplied from space with the technology then available was something between three and five times the competitive power from coal plants, for example. And that lack of competition from the financial perspective has been used by its opponents for many years to great effect. But as is pointed out by Lieutenant Colonel Paul Dapos of the National Security Space Agency, Space uh, Organization, the technology that's advanced from 1970 until today has made massive advances. 
solar power generation, for example, has gone from the photovoltaic cells have gone from something like 17 percent uh, to 40 percent, and they're going beyond that. And there are some people that say that it can go as high as 90 percent by making use of the organic rods that we possess in our eyeballs that give us the gift of sight. I do not know where it will go, but the fact is that today we can get by with about one-fourth the solar array and, in consequence, one-fourth the weight of those arrays, and that will help us with mass that we have to put in, in geostationary orbit, which is admittedly expensive. I don't think we should have begun implementation of the system at the end of our studies in 1980. Our technology simply wasn't ready for it. But I believe the situation is vastly different today, and we at least have the obligation to find out whether it's overcome the perceived deficiency in cost. And uh, what we need to do is to repeat the roughly $20 million study that was done in the 1977 to 1980 interval. And since the dollar has uh, now gone to 15 cents, it's obviously going to cost more than $20 million. But it would not cost more than $100 million to conclusively demonstrate, in my opinion, that space solar power is, if anything, more efficient than is the full price, which is not frequently admitted, of uh, competitive sources. We all know that wind, tide, and terrestrial solar are receiving great subsidies. We're spending a great deal of money in this country making ethanol from corn, which many people consider to be a net loss in energy, and it's pretty fertilizer and other chemicals into the Mississippi River, such as we have a dead zone outside the mouth of the Mississippi River, the size of Massachusetts. And yet we continue to fund organic fuel, that is ethanol, made from corn, which benefits primarily the huge industrial conglomerates now running most of the farming of corn. So we need to stop doing dumb things and get on with doing this smart thing and study space solar power. But its political constituency lacks a great deal. And until we can get going with uh, at least this uh, $100 million piece of business that I'm talking about, we won't be able to convert the politicians uh, in the face. My Connecticut friend and I have given up on trying to persuade this particular federal government that the study should be done and instead I have a group of 10 of us, uh, most of them friends back from the 1970 and 80 time period, that have gathered together as volunteers to try to prepare a straw man program and uh, initial cost of the program and have this as an input to a major architectural engineering firm that's conducted huge uh, venture studies in the